Welcome back. We'll pick up where we left off, namely, using Dr. Shirley's clean solution of an abstract class for anything a ray might hit. And what does a ray hit presently? We have a world dot hit, world being a sphere list object. This method returns a Boolean and has this signature of four parameters. The const at the end means this method isn't allowed to mutate any of its data members. In sphere list, we see object.hit, object being a sphere. This method also returns a Boolean and has the same signature. It's from here where we can create a class called hittable that declares this hit method, which returns a bool and has that same signature. That equals zero means it's a pure virtual function, and any derived class will have to define it. By having this pure virtual member function, hittable is an abstract class. We'll make sphere and sphere list, which we will rename to hittable list, derive from the abstract class and make them override their hit methods. And so we derive sphere from hittable. The hit method overrides the abstract class's method without a fuss. Easy enough. Now let's take a look at the sphere list class. First we'll rename it, because even though in this book we are only dealing with spheres, we'll make it ready for other hittable objects. We'll derive from the base class an override and change the vector from a list of spheres to a list of hittables. We can fix some errors by using refs here and deal with this one by making a list of const objects. Let's run the code and see if we're good. We see an error, which should have shown up in the IDE. A vector of hittable instances is not something C++ can deal with. Hittable is an abstract class. C++ vectors work by knowing how much space to allocate when new objects are added to it, and this can't work for abstract classes. The way around this is to say that instead of a vector of hittable objects, we'll have a vector of pointers to hittable objects. C++ can figure that out we just push the address of the hittable to the list. Since an object is now a pointer, we need to use the arrow operator here. Let's see if we can compile and run. Indeed we can. Now there is one more thing I'm sure you noticed in the book. Instead of just using raw pointers here, they use smart pointers. In later books, when we have to worry about memory management, Smart pointers are there to make life easier. This is an example of a memory leak. After add sphere to list terminates, S1 lives on in the list. If the list itself goes out of scope, the objects pointed to will still live on. These are memory leaks. Smart pointers deal with it for us. They keep track of when this memory can be freed up. Shared pointer is a type of smart pointer. We'll push the pointers as shown. And we're good to go. A few more things to refactor. We'll move some of these using directives. And we'll make hit record a class. We'll also include an interval class and a camera class. Interval has two data members, min and max, and we'll just be using this surrounds method. We use interval in place of the min and max passed to the hit method. And we'll use interval.surrounds here. As for the camera class, I just cut and pasted it for brevity, but it pretty much is the same code we had in main. It includes render and ray color as methods.
The next part of the book implements anti-aliasing. We're going to come back to this later. Now we're going to talk about what rays do out in the world. They reflect, they get absorbed, they refract. Generally, there are two types of reflections, specular and diffuse. Diffuse reflections occur when a ray is reflected at many angles, like on a matte surface. Specular reflection occurs when it's reflected at just one angle, like a mirror. Dr. Shirley states that an algorithm that randomizes direction will produce surfaces that look matte. Let's see how we can do that. We know our incident ray, the hit point P, and the normal from the hit record. This tangent line, which is a plane in 3D, defines two half spaces on either side. We can generate some random ray with its origin at the hit point, and if its direction points away from the surface, we're good. To do this, we simply check if its direction dotted with the normal is positive. Here is the random on hemisphere function that takes a vector, the normal, and generates a random vector by calling random on unit sphere, which we dot together. If the dot product is negative, we just use the opposite direction. Random on unit sphere creates a vector with its components randomized to a number between minus 1 and 1. Random double ultimately uses the C++ rand function to get us our random numbers. Pretty straightforward, I'd say. But what happens next? That is to say, what color is the ray? Let's review what we already have. The function ray color takes a ray and returns a color. It checks if there's a hit. If there is, it returns a color based on the hit point's normal. If there's a miss, it returns some shade of blue based on the ray direction's y components. And again to review, a ray is a point and a direction. Here's a 2D drawing of our world as it is. And here's our setup, the camera origin and the viewpoint. With this particular ray from point O in direction D, we call the ray color function. There's no hit, and the function will return a shade of blue based on the ray direction's y component. Now let's look at this ray, OL. It hits. We'll do our diffuse reflection ray calculation and get a new ray from point P in direction RP. And here's the thing we're going to do. We'll call the ray color function again, but with this new ray. Instead of returning the color from the normal, we'll return whatever ray color returns with this new ray. If we do that, we find that we get another hit. We'll create a new reflection ray, this time from point Q in direction RQ. And we'll return the result of calling ray color again with this ray. What happens here? It misses. We can see that RQ is pointing almost straight up, and so its Y component will be close to 1. This would return a very blue color. And so ultimately, the color returned for the ray OL is going to be very blue. What we've done is recursively call ray color. If you're new to recursion, it may seem like some kind of sorcery for ray color to call ray color. But every time we do, it's with a new ray, and eventually it will stop recursing because a miss will happen. To implement this is very simple. Instead of returning a color based on the normal, we return the result of calling ray color with a new ray. Let's run and see what happens. We see that the spheres are quite blue, because there is a high chance a ray into the viewport will ultimately miss by reflecting up like in the example, even if there are many reflections before that happens. We're going to do one more thing. Rays can get absorbed. With every hit, we can attenuate. Instead of just returning the result of the ray color call, we'll return it multiplied by 0.5. Using the same example as before, the initial ray will be one quarter as bright. So let's multiply by 0 0.5 and see what we get.
it's a lot darker, especially here where we can expect a lot of reflections. We mentioned that we will eventually stop recursing once a miss happens, but that could be in a while. In fact, theoretically, it could go on forever if every random ray happens to hit. So we'll add a hit count called depth to ray color signature. The initial call here will be with some value, 10 in this case. And for every recursive call, we'll subtract 1. If we get to 0, we'll just return the color black. Since after this many reflections, the color will probably be black anyways, it's hard to see any difference. If we make the hit count 2 though, we can see its effect. For fun, let's make it 1. Can you imagine what it's going to look like? We'll put it back to its default and overwrite it for ourselves, like Dr. Shirley does. So we've been introduced to diffuse reflection, and we modeled it by finding some random direction on the hemisphere. We say a ray is scattered in a uniform distribution with that model. But as Dr. Shirley states, a more accurate representation of real diffuse objects is the Lambertian distribution. He continues, This distribution scatters reflected rays in a manner that is proportional to cos theta, where theta is the angle between the reflected ray and the surface normal. We can create this distribution by adding a random unit vector to the normal vector. We can see here that for the same distribution of points on both models, the Lambertian model reflects more towards the normal. When we make this change and run, we see shadows are more pronounced as more rays are reflected to the normal and fewer rays are reflected off to the side. A little side note. This is a drawing of unfinished wood, a close approximation of a Lambertian surface viewed from on top and from an angle. Lambertian surfaces such as these are ideal diffuse reflectors because their illuminated brightness is the same, regardless of the observer's angle of view. Even though the amount or intensity of light reflected off the surface decreases with cos theta, the apparent area over which it's reflecting decreases at the same rate. The brightness is the intensity divided by the area, which remains constant. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. We're now going to deal a little bit with color. Suffice to say, we need to gamma correct the colors, meaning we have to take the square root of the color values to make things look better on our screen. I'd say it does. Now let's go back and review what happens when we attenuate by 0.5. We're actually multiplying all the components by 0.5. So this is the same thing. We can fiddle with the individual components. Let's attenuate less red than green and blue. We should expect some ruddier coloration in the spheres. If we make the red component more than one, after enough reflections, we will oversaturate. Our PPM value for red will be over 255. There should not be any green in there. So we clamp our values as not to go over 1. We'll add clamp to interval, and we'll use an interval to ensure we're within these limits when writing out the color to the PPM file. Running again, we see this, which should be what's expected. But of course, we're setting the color for all the spheres in our world. Dr. Shirley introduces a material class to deal with this and other concerns, which we'll get to later. For now, we'll just update the sphere class to take a color in its constructor and pass it in. We call it albedo, a word that means the fraction of sunlight that is diffusely reflected by a body. We'll pass this back by updating the hit record with this value. We call it attenuation there and use it in ray color. While we're at it, we'll also add our new reflected ray to the hit record. We'll call this property scattered.
Before we refactor to material classes, let's discuss the other type of reflection, specular reflection. Dr. Shirley gives a good geometrical explanation on how to find a reflection vector, but I'm more analytic, so let's find this ourselves. Here's what we're dealing with. An incident vector V and some reflected vector R off the surface. We know the incident vector V, the normal to the surface N, and we also know that by definition, the angle V makes to the normal is the same as the angle R makes with it, even if we don't know what those angles are directly. Note that to do algebraic operations on our vectors, we need them to start at the origin. So I'll write a vector A which is just negative v. I'm going to draw the component parts of our vectors. These are the components that are parallel to the surface, and these are the perpendicular ones. The idea is to find the parallel and perpendicular parts of the vector r, add them up, and get our result. We can see the perpendicular part of a is the same as the perpendicular part of r and the parallel part of A is the inverse of the parallel part of R. Perpendicular A is A dot N in the N direction, and we can find the parallel part like this. Now let's just plug this in and find R. R parallel is minus A parallel, and R perpendicular is A perpendicular. Carrying along and then subbing minus V for A, we get this. We'll add this to the VEC3 file, and for now use it to find our scattered direction and new ray. Let's run and see. One last thing we'll do for now is add another parameter, a boolean, to the sphere class which will determine if it's a diffuse or specular, that is metal, surface, and we'll choose the scattered ray accordingly. We'll add a few more spheres, make one greenish, one bluish, and make them metal. Let's run. Here's the same image with a width of 4,000 pixels. Looking pretty good. We're getting further along, but there's still more to do. Looking forward to seeing you in part three of this series.